Um, we talked about this earlier with the players' weekend, and I love the fact that Gardner puts Gardner. He's not going to play any games. Yeah. And I, I doubt that Jeter would have put anything on his uniform. What, what would you have done? We talked about this last year. Remember, sexy taxi. Yeah. That was going to be. That was. You would have really done that. I would have, why not? That's it's a shame. ridiculous. First of all, it's re, the whole players weekend's ridiculous to Thank begin you. with. So <laughs> it might as well be ridiculous with it. <laughs> now, you know what baseball reminds me of, Mark, and I love baseball. But when they try to be quote unquote hip, it's like the old guy trying to be hip, right? It's like it's like when your mom, like my my dad wanted to relate to me and like would start talking about my bands. Like that guy Judas Priest, he he sounds like he's cool. No, that it's, it's a band. It's not it's not a guy. Like it, 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 it's an old man trying too hard. This me this to me seems like an old man trying too hard. This is not going to get the youth of America excited about baseball. It's not. There are things that baseball could do every day. Um, little things like letting guys, you know, wear wear special cleats. Um, you know, ha having having a, a little bit more fun in game, like during during the game. I mean, I'm not saying go minor leagues demolition derby style, but you know, uh, I think Major League Baseball is trying their best. Players Weekend, I think it'll probably last a few years and then it's going to go away. Uh, let's uh, let's talk about Greg Bird. I know you're a fan and I'm a fan. Two for twenty five on this road trip, and he is not had that kind of liftoff that we thought he was going to have. Any concern on your part? I'm concerned just for the fact uh, he's not hitting fastballs. Uh, when I was struggling, you know, no matter if it was a young player or, or as I got older, I could still always hit the fastball. You know, you know, whether I had to cheat or not you know, you know, might be a different story, but you threw me a fastball over the middle of the plate, I was going to hit it. If you can't catch up to fastballs, if you can't catch up to velocity, um, you're going to have a problem in today's baseball. And that's the only thing I worry about with Greg Bird is that are some of these injuries taking their toll? Is he a guy that kind of has that, that nice, sweet, relaxed swing that in baseball in 2018 where everyone throws 95 and above, it's just not equating to success for him. And are you seeing that? Uh, do you think it could be physical? <sighs> I don't know. I mean, again, you should be able to hit a fastball. Like, you know, guys in the big leagues that, you know, when you hear a scout talk about, well, he has a problem with the breaking ball. That's okay. I don't mind if a guy has a problem with the breaking ball because every pitcher has to throw a fastball over the plate eventually. And, and if you are not hitting a fastball consistently in the big leagues, you will not have consistent success. That is a fact. And so there's, there lies the problem with him, and I don't know exactly what it is. Is it physical? Is it just the way that he swings? Does he need to make some adjustments mechanically? But um, I think the Yankees are hoping he figures it out quickly because, you know, you can get by playing the Chicago White Sox without a, a healthy, productive Greg Bird or a healthy, productive Glaber Torres. You're not going to win in the playoffs without those guys doing something. How does this Red Sox team measure up to the, the great Red Sox teams you faced? Better. Um... In, in pretty much all regards. The only thing I would say is that the great Red Sox teams um, that, you know, that won championships in 04 and 07 and, and 2013 had a ton of veterans. And there's a really good balance between the veteran and, and young players. A lot of these guys are kind of in between, um, which I'm not, I don't know if it's good or bad, but I'm just wondering in a playoff situation when you have so many good young players, guys that maybe aren't as playoff tested, will that come back to, to bite the Red Sox? And, and we'll find out in October. Uh, you know, last year they, they obviously had a great season and got bounced uh, in the first round. And I'm wondering if the experience or, or lack of experience hurt them. What did that four-game sweep of the Yankees tell you? Anything? Well, they're better right now, and I think the Yankees, uh, just the, the two guys I talked about, Torres and Bird, have to get going. Obviously, when Aaron Judge comes back, that's going to be huge, but, you know, it's going to be very difficult to beat the Red Sox or the Astros, for that matter, without better starting pitching, and, and it's a broken record, but it's something that we have to talk about because as much as we can feel good about the Yankees, you know, on pace to win 102 games. This is a great team. This Yankee team is a, is a great team, but they're not better than the Red Sox. Mm -hmm. And so that's a problem because you're going to have to beat them eventually if you want to go to the World Series. Now, Judge being out, and I think having Sanchez in and if he was performing better, 
would make this team better. So obviously you're going to struggle when you lose your best players. But when you look at Houston, you know, no Springer, no Correa, no Altuve, and they continue to win. Is that just how deep they are as a team, or does a veteran team that's been there, done that, just able to survive the injuries better? And they also don't have your stepbrother, Brian McCann. Yeah, that's true. Yeah, yeah. You know, once Matt comes back, it's game over. They may not lose another game. <laughs> uh, but, no, in, in all seriousness, it, it's their starting pitching. You can lose a an all-star and out to the MVP. You can lose an all-star in, in Correa. You can lose guys like that here and there when your starting pitching is dominant, like the Astros. And and that's what you worry a little bit about, about with the Yankees is you know, everyone's – or not everyone, but a lot of people are saying, oh, well, you know, Judge and Sanchez are out. Yeah, but if their starting pitchers give up five or six runs – every time out or can't get out of the third inning, it doesn't matter if Judge and Sanchez are back. It, you're not going to outscore teams consistently 10-8 to 8 in the playoffs. I, I just don't think you can win a World Series like that. And so as, as big of a boost as it will be, the, the Yankees still need to shore up the rotation and figure out who are going to be those four guys going into October. Stanton with a grand slam yesterday. He has certainly, if not put the team on his back, he's done what he's supposed to do. Is this the player they traded for? I think it is. I mean, I, I think fans are probably going to say, well, he's not having as good of a season as he did last year. Well, he won the MVP. I mean, he, he's not getting any better than being the MVP. So, um, you know, the, the Yankees bought high. I mean, you know, by definition, you can't buy a guy any higher than, than what he when he's coming off of an MVP season. So, yeah, I mean, from that regard, he's not having as good of a season. But for me, for, for my team, I'm putting him 3-4 every single day and loving what he's doing right now. I mean, this guy, mm. he, he's going to hit 30-plus home runs and drive in 100 RBIs. He is a huge force. Whether he gets a hit or not, pitchers are careful with him. And I think he's a guy that ultimately his season will be judged by how far the Yankees go in the playoffs. And, and, and how well he does in the playoffs. If he hits one or two big home runs in a playoff run and, and the Yankees win a World Series, he will be a hero. And, you know, forget about, you know, he, he didn't hit 55 and, and 140 like last year, but he's going to be a big part of a good team in October. All right, play doctor for me. Kevin Kernan tweets out, Judge will not swing a bat because he has pain in end range of motion. Explain what that means. It, I can do everything kind of slowly, smoothly, and feel good about where I am when I'm uh, coming off of a wrist injury, and I had two wrist injuries in my career. The, the, the last test is letting it go, taking that full swing, and end range is, you know, when you roll your wrist over. So at contact, you're hitting the ball, and then rolling your wrists over, when you have pain in that moment, that's a bad sign. And I just think I think Aaron Judge will eventually get healthy because um, the nature of the fracture wasn't terrible. I just think it's going to be longer than people expect. I'm watching Zach Britton pitch. And all I can imagine, and this is not a knock on the kid because I, I, I trade the defense for the offense. How is Gary Sanchez going to catch Zach Britton? Oh, I, I hear you, Michael. It, that's going to be tough. Um, I, I mean, Austin Romine, just, who's a great defender, is having a tough time. Yes, I, I watched the, that outing where, where Austin actually had a, had a couple great blocks. Right. And then the, the ball that almost looked like it was going to be a strike darted down at the last second and was the pass ball. I mean, this is going to be an issue for the Yankees moving forward because – um, Zach Britton has one of the most unique left-handed sinker balls, you know, power sinkers in baseball history. And you just don't see guys throw balls like that. And if Gary Sanchez is having problems catching or blocking regular pitching, it's going to be very difficult for him in the eighth inning when the tying run is at third base for Zach Britton to feel really good about throwing that power sinker in the dirt with Gary back there. So I think Gary is working on that right now mentally or, or physically, you know, uh, trying to figure out how he's going to catch Zach Britton. You know, so much has been made about the DeGrom record when you're talking about the Cy Young. He's 6-7, and seven, but he's got a 1.77 earn run average, much better than Scherzer's, who's over 2. 
But Scherzer's got a lot of other statistics on DeGrom. Is being that big an advantage at ERA to you enough for DeGrom to take home the Cy Young if things stay the way they're going? I don't think so, Don. As much as I love Jacob DeGrom and wish that he had a, a better season record-wise, because the Mets have been so so bad when he pitches. I just don't think, you know, he's 6-7 and seven right now. He may, he's not even going to get to 10 wins. And they're, they're such a, it's such a bad team. Scherzer's 15-5 and five on a team that's fighting for their playoff lives. I just think that the voters are going to take all of that into account. I think they're going to tip their caps to Jacob DeGrom and say, great season, but it's not Cy Young worthy because of these other factors. You probably heard what Jason Wirth, the former Philly, said. Uh, he said, quote, they've got all these super nerds, as I call them, in the front office that know nothing about baseball, but they like to project numbers and project players. I think it's killing the game. It's to the point where just put computers out there, just put laptops and what have you. Just put them out there and let them play. We don't even need to go out there anymore. It's a joke. Do most players feel like this? Do you feel like this? No, most players do not feel like this. Maybe five years ago, the first time you know one of these quote-unquote nerds came to us and said, hey, I want you to think about this or, or look at these numbers, maybe we had an initial reaction that was, who are these guys? But I mean, what year is it? J Jason Worth is unfortunately just upset that his career ended the way it ended. He wanted to keep playing. He didn't get a contract. I'm sure his agent was telling him, well, the reason he didn't get a contract is because all of these statistics don't match up. He's just upset, and um, I don't think we should give this any credence because baseball today is, has embraced analytics, and the best teams, and I'll put the Yankees out there as, as one of those teams, know how to mesh the, the analytical guys of the front office and the baseball scouting guys of the front office and make the, the right decisions. And I think you know those quote-unquote nerds are a huge part of baseball and they're not going away. You know, it, it's funny. I, I always wondered this. The guys in the locker room that go out on the field, they were never friends. And I don't want to call somebody a nerd because it's a, it's a pejorative term. They were never friends for the most part with these guys that are coming down. Is it a hard adjustment to have a guy who obviously didn't play for the most part, most of them didn't play, but they're super bright and they figured out the angles telling you what to do. Yeah, it's, and that's a great point, Michael. It, it all depends on how that guy is coming down and, and giving you the information. And I think that's why you have some of these managers um, that, are, that are bridging the gap, the, the Alex Cora, Aaron Boone types that are now bridging the gap between the, the front office analytical guys and the players. Because if a guy comes, if, if I'm in an 0 for 20 slump, and I'm already upset, and some guy comes down that I know has never played baseball or hasn't played since he was five years old and tells me, hey, Tex, why can't you hit this pitch? It's this easy. Look at the numbers. I might tell him just to just get out. <laughs> but if he comes down with a coach by his side and we have a, a you know, intellectual conversation about how pitchers are attacking me and maybe I want to think about adjusting my approach, then, you know, I'm, I'm going to listen. But I think it all depends on, on how these guys are coming down into the clubhouse. I think that's evolved as well, too. That, five years ago, again, that, that was not, um, it was not an easy transition for those guys to come into the locker room. I think now, because of the way the coaching staffs are put together, I think it's a lot easier. Some of those guys are pretty aggressive, though. I've heard with other teams, like, they, they march into a manager's office and start cursing, why didn't you do this? I mean, that must be a tough adjustment. And you know what, Michael? Those guys are not going to have long careers in baseball because the fact of the matter is, as smart as you are, as uh, as sound as your numbers and your advice might be, it, this game is played on the field. It's played between the lines by by a bunch of guys that give their heart and soul, play through injuries. You know, this is this is our lives. You know, it's mm -hmm. a physical game. I have to be I have to be physically on top of my game. I don't care what the numbers say sometimes. I might override you with how I feel. And if you're overly aggressive with your numbers and your analytics and and you got to do it this way, you're not going to have a long career in this game. Dude, I'm glad you said that because there has to be room for gut. There has to be room for heart. Sports is interesting because people defy the numbers. All right, upsets are occur because people defy the numbers. That's why you go out there and you play the game. And I just wonder sometimes, to Jason's point, Jason Worth, 
that does that get lost in all the analytics? I want this guy to play. Yeah, but he's 0 for 20 against lefties. And it, no, I want. I just feel that he's ready to pop. I want to be able to have that in the game. And as long as that's in the game, I can live with the analytics. But you wonder if some teams don't allow that heart and that desire and that human element to blossom in their sport. Yep, and Don, it happened, um, the Yankees-Red Sox series, Steve Pierce hits three homers, uh, the game where That's a lefty right. started. The next day, he's in the lineup. And I remember watching the game, and I'm not sure you know, who it might have been you guys, Michael, saying, hey, you know, the numbers say he shouldn't be starting this game. Right. But, but Alex Cora has a really good feeling about Steve Pearson. He's the hot one. And they actually showed Mitch Moreland in the dugout. This is an all-star that's, that the numbers say probably should be starting. But, but Mitch Moreland's got a big smile on his face, che cheering on Steve Pierce. And what did Steve Pierce do? He went deep again. And so, so you're right, Don. You have to have that gut. You have to look at a player in the eyes and, and talk to the hitting coach and say, is this guy hot? How's this guy feeling? And the hitting coach and the players say, yep, put me in that lineup, and I'll produce for you. A couple of text messages before we let you go. Mike and Selden asked a very simple question, Mark. Do you think you would have picked Ann Duhar's throw from the other night that Bird couldn't? <laughs> oh, man. <laughs> the easy answer is, of course I would have picked it, because I don't ever remember missing a pick my entire career. <laughs> I, I think I was 100% picking. Um but I'm, I'm going to leave that one at that. I always think that I was going to pick that ball. <laughs> All right. Aldo, D'Amico, and my old stomping ground of Hartsdale, which offseason moves should the Yankees prioritize to ensure a lengthy championship run? Uh, for, for next season? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Patrick Corbin. Left-hander left from, from the Diamondbacks, pitches in a, in a pitcher-friendly ballpark. Uh, I think his last outing was six or seven scoreless. He's pitched in big games. I really like the way he plays the game. Good athlete. And um, I'm a big fan of lefties in New York uh, just to, to keep, keep righties away from that short, short porch. You know, right-handed pitchers seem to get dinged up a little bit more in New York. All right, two of your former teams going at it tonight. First of four, hope you enjoy the series, and we thank you for coming on.